Robert Luna is still with us uh, of Shore West Capital. Uh, Robert, I want to get your thoughts in on the whole Twitter saga. I mean, do they want to be bought by, by uh, Elon Musk or not? Yeah, I mean, it looks like the deal is going to be going through. I mean, surprise to a lot of people out there. I thought that there was going to be this drug out court battle that was going to go back and forth. I really would have never put a single dollar on the fact that Elon Musk was going to wind up paying up to that original price. He was talking about these things in terms of bots. Obviously, there's been a huge movement in the market, so we could have easily came back and talked about not being able to raise debt, which we still are unaware of. That's probably the big caveat right now. Is he going to be able to raise the money to close on this deal. He's the richest man in the world. More than likely, he'll probably uh, be able to do it. Um, that being said, uh, is this really the best use of Elon Musk's time? Is this where he should be spending his focus? Who am I to say? I, I would say not. Uh, as a Tesla shareholder, I'm not extremely excited about it. But if I was, uh, you know, a Twitter shareholder, this is this is this is good news. And you would still buy Twitter. I mean, did you think at 50, 34, it, it still looks compelling? Well, I mean, it's more of a merger arbitrage bet at this point to whether or not the deal goes through. So I, I, I think for most investors, if you're not in the deal, I wouldn't be trying to play that game right here. Rob, I've got to ask you, because you mentioned in the, the previous block about Netflix, they've announced that, that $6.99 deal. Do you think that yeah. this is going to be enough of a catalyst moving forward in terms of the recurring revenue? Because as someone who subscribes to Netflix, I don't know if I'd want to go down to that $6.99 tier and have to deal with like three to five minutes of ads. Yeah, I, I know I won't be doing it for sure. So, uh, you know, there are, there are going to be some people that, that it's attractive to. Um, there's going to be some of the younger generation, especially, look, if we're going into recession here and there are people really on the border of being able to afford a full price subscription, maybe it makes sense for them. At the end of the day, when you look at the valuations, X advertising, though, it's the cheapest we've ever seen the stock. It's only trading at about 19 and a half, 20 times forward earnings. And Netflix is one of those things I call these small luxuries that if we are going into recession, people are probably gonna spend more time watching Netflix than going out. So I think it's in a pretty good position right here. But I do think advertising is being underestimated. I think it's gonna be a bigger component two to three years from now and be a lot more successful than most analysts. I know it got down, well, a reiterated downgrade um, today from, from an analyst out there who doesn't, doesn't really believe in the advertising revenue. Sticking with a similar kind of thematic, but obviously this next company does have a lot of other parts to it. I want to talk about Disney as well because you, you like Disney. That whole DraftKings thing with ESPN, do you think that this could be a, potentially a lot more than what even the, the markets are believing that it could be, considering how big sports gambling is going to be in the United States once it gets legalised across the states and just the integration potential with ESPN and the, the bespoke things that they could create? And I would imagine that ESPN would be trying to get a cut out of whatever DraftKings pulls in as well. Yeah, I, I'd imagine, I know, you know, Disney, as you, as you mentioned, is a big, a big ship. So I don't know that it's gonna have, uh, you know, a huge uh, input to their earnings, but it's definitely something that's positive. As you mentioned, fast growing segment, a lot of people are adopting it. DraftKings itself has, you know, been doing pretty well, putting up good numbers. They've had some challenges, but it, it definitely could be something. But, you know, I think the bigger issue for, for or the bigger opportunity for Disney is people have been, locked up for so long. If you go to any of the theme parks, I spent time in California and Florida this year, they're absolutely packed. They're able to have surge pricing now. They've actually cut off added annual passes because they want to be able to pass that, that along. Everything is packed. They have a new cruise ship that just came on, fully booked, another one coming on next year. A lot of good stuff in the pipeline for Disney that because people are really torn up in this downward market or overlooking right now, and I think that's going to be a winner uh, in the next two to three months. Okay, uh, I, I also want to talk about your uh, your pick with LUV, which is Southwest Airlines. Uh, how, how are you looking at you know your position with the travel stocks and related themes? Yeah, well, if you look at Delta, they just booked their largest revenue number ever. Uh, and if you've flown anywhere, prices are going up, but people are still paying. Planes are packed. And it goes back to, you know what I was saying, I think when we we're all locked up in COVID, you really saw, and you see this with what's going on with CPI right now, you see this, what's going on. There is a slowdown in certain segments, maybe the stuff where people aren't buying as much stuff, maybe not buying as many cars, not buying as much clothes, but the experiences are starting to pick up. People wanna get out, they wanna do things. And I think Love Southwest is a best in breed airline carrier. They've been able to manage costs considerably well. They don't have any international exposure. So I think Southwest that has a cult following at these valuations 
makes a lot of sense. I don't personally own the stock. I've never owned an airline stock, <laughs> but I'm actually looking at potentially purchasing that one. I was actually wondering about that in terms of that, but I've got to push back a little bit on Southwest. You would think because they're not necessarily like a Delta, like an American, they don't have the transatlantic travel that if there was to be a macro slowdown in the US, a potentially a deeper recession than people are expecting, that they'd take a pretty big hit. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think so. I think, as, as I mentioned, I think people might not be going to Europe or they might, you know, not be going to Asia. But I think, you know, flying from California to Arizona, you see that happening all the time. These short haul flights are probably what people will be doing, tightening in their budget a little bit. Uh, more than likely, I think, and we've seen that before in past recessions, that, you know, Southwest has done a pretty good job at managing that. We're going to have to leave it there, Robert. Pleasure as always and thank you for joining us on Inflation Day as well. That was Robert Luna from Shorevest Wealth Management.